Jesus Christ. We welcome you to our service here at Beulah Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia. Nothing has changed. We want you to have an exciting time, even though we are coming to you in this type of fashion. We want you to sing with us. We want you to open up your word and follow along with us. And today we're going to have virtual communion. So after the preaching of God's word, we're asking that you have the elements of some type of bread and some type of juice as we take communion together. We're excited once again to be able to serve our God. And not only serve our God, we're excited about serving you. So come on, y'all. Let's lift up the name of Jesus.
Come on, y'all. Let's put our hands together. I am confident that through this pandemic, we shall see the goodness of the Lord. Uh, but unique praise said, are we willing to wait on the Lord? Are we willing to trust in our God in these uncertain times? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Once again, let's give it up to our Lord Jesus Christ that there is no God like him in all the earth. Once again, good morning, Facebook Live. Are we excited about culminating our series entitled Off Limits? Those that have your Bibles, please find 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. As we dig into God's word this morning, please keep those Bibles open and those apps unlocked as we're going to spend time here this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, as we culminate our series entitled Off Limits. Off Limits. I will be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 1, Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. He says this, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Paul was saying these are not our commandments. These commandments come from the Lord himself. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarn you and testified. Verse 7, for God did not call us to uncleanness but in holiness. Therefore he who rejects this does not reject man but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful this morning that this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it that we can say bold, we can say confidently that the Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom should we fear? The Lord is the strength of our life. Of whom should we be afraid? Holy Spirit of the living God, have your way. Move like only you can move and do what only you can do. Lord, we're praying for transformed lives. Not just another church service, but a real and fresh encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I'm your man for the next several mo moments and minutes. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Once again, we are honored to be able to bring church to you by way of Facebook Live as we finish our series, Off Limits. Off Limits. Before we got into our series, Seeing Jesus in 3G, we were dealing with the series, Off Limits. And the whole goal of our series, Off Limits, was to teach us about sanctification. I need you to stay with me. Stay with me. We were teaching men and women, believers, about sanctification. Uh, uh, let me give you some synonyms to sanctification. We were teaching us about learning to live separated from the world. Not only does sanctification mean living separate, it means separation. It means holiness. It means purity. Our first message that we dealt with in our series entitled Off Limits was purity must be our priority. We looked at first Peter as Peter began to say that we are to live holy because God is holy. In our second message in our series Off Limits, we dealt with delivered 
to be different. We dress 1 Corinthians chapter 6 as Paul was reminding the believers at Corinth that God had delivered them to be different now. He said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe around verse 11, he said, And such were some of you, meaning that the life you once lived before you came to know Jesus Christ, you shouldn't be living that life anymore. And then our last message we heard, out with the old and in with the new as Paul addressed the, Col the, the church at Colossae, he addressed them all. It's time for us to put off the old, but it's time for us to put on the new. But now, part four of our series, Off Limits, we are going to deal with the, the topic of walking to please God. Walking to please God. The reason we must deal with the issue of sanctification because a lot of people who have experienced their salvation don't know what to do after that. But immediately following our salvation, all believers should start the process of sanctification. Uh, let me tell you what my definition of sanctification is. This is what my definition over the last several messages. Sanctification is looking less like the world, but looking more like the word. That's what sanctification is. That every believer must grow to a point in his or her life that they're no longer looking like the world, but they're looking like the word. In other words, if salvation is our relationship with Jesus then sanctification should be our resemblance of Jesus. Uh, before my mama passed, uh, uh, almost eight years ago, uh, I used to walk in the house, and this is what my mom used to say to me, boy, the older you get, the more you look like your daddy. That should be the testimony of all children of God, that the older we get spiritually, the more we should be looking like our heavenly Father. I'm talking about walking to please God, sanctification. I'm going to push it right now because too many preachers are so busy telling people what they can get from God. Let me come in front of the podium now. All over the airways, uh, preachers are so busy telling people what they can get from God, but they're not teaching people that they got to live godly before God. I just pushed it early in the message. And they think that God is a cosmic genie that we can just live any kind of old way and just think that God is just going to pour our blessings upon us. That's not the God uh, that we serve. God does want to bless his children, but he blesses us as we are living the way he's commanded us to live according to his word. And that is walking to please God. Uh oh, this life, this series, Off Limits, stay with me now, Off Limits, what is the whole idea of Off Limits? Off Limits means letting the world know, letting sin know, letting Satan know that I no longer belong to you. I am now Off Limits. Uh, this series comes from that great theologian, oh uh, no, that great poet. Uh, y'all, I know y'all love Shakespeare and all those, but that poet that I know called M.C. Hammer. In other words, Off Limits means you can't touch this. Uh, off limits is getting to a point in our Christian life to let the world know you can't touch this. I don't belong to you anymore. I belong to God. I'm going to slow down and tell you what the series Off Limits really uh, give you an illustration of what Off Limits really mean. Y'all ready for this? Facebook, y'all ready for this? Uh, the series Off Limits means sanctification. It means separation. It means let's be set apart. Uh, off limits, as Paul is going to address and as we are going to deal with, it's like the living room in a black family house as a 70s kid. I just went there. Some of y'all going to feel me right now. Sanctification. Off limits is like the living room in a black family's house as a 70s kid. Now, I know today's kid, they, they go wherever they want to go in the house. But when we were coming up, there was one place in that house you did not go, and that was in the living room. Y'all stay with me now, Facebook. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. 
uh, our mom wasn't even home and and it was like she had eyes all over the house that even though she wasn't home our living room was right off of the kitchen and and though mom and dad wasn't home we'll walk down the hallway like a robot we'll turn automatic knowing not to go in that living room because it was sanctified it was set apart. Uh, if something dropped in the living room by accident, well, we were scared. I mean, should I even go and get it or wait the mama come home? Because we understood that the living room was off. It was off limits. Matter of fact, in some people's house, the whole front door was off limits. Y'all, y'all not working with me. Uh, most of the time in, in the average house, the whole front door was off limits. You had to come to the side door or the back door you had to be special in order to come through the front door and the living room or what God is saying today just like that living room was set apart just like that living room was sanctified I've called all my children to be sanctified to be set apart that you tell that world that you are off limits I'm walking to please God. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exalt in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Paul addresses the issue of sanctification with the Thessalonians. And Paul is trying to build the foundation here because I need you to get this Facebook Live. I need you to get there, the few members that are here. Where Paul is trying to tell them, it doesn't matter how the culture lives, your conduct should be the walk to please God. Uh, the Thessalonians was in an immoral culture. There was an immoral society. And Paul was reminding you, you ought to be different. And I'm challenging all of us that in this time of darkness and depravity, God has called us to be different. And what Paul is addressing here, he's starting with the house, he's starting with the home, he's starting with the marriage. I just pushed it right there. Paul is starting with the house, he's starting with the home, he's starting with the marriage. Can I push it right now? This is what Paul is saying. I want to start with the home. I want to start with the marriage. Because I'm a firm believer, if you get a man or woman that's walking to please God at the house there, you can get them to walk to please God anywhere. Uh, y'all, y'all not following me. <laughs> but you find me the man or woman that's not walking to please God there at the house, they're not walking to please God anywhere. See, if you can walk to please God in those four walls of your home, it doesn't matter if you're at the job, at the ball game, at the convenience store, at the grocery store, you'll still have the mindset that I'm not here to please myself. I'm here to please God. That's why I often say there's a lot of phoniness going on all over the Christian land and folks are come to church when we gather physically and they're coming with their hallelujahs and they're coming with their thank you Jesus and they'll carry the Bible just right and they'll do all those things but they ain't living nothing at the house no it starts at the house by walking to please God are y'all still with me I said this part four off limits is about what Walking to please God. If you're living it in the house there, you can live it anywhere. And if you're not living it there, you're not living it anywhere. I promise you that. You, t- you show me the man or woman that's living godly at the job, really godly at the, at the Whole Foods and the Kroger's, it's because they're already practicing the walk to please God at the house. This is what Paul is trying to get over to the Thessalonians, and this is what I'm trying to get over to us this morning. We must walk to please God. Paul often relates the Christian life to a walk. Why is that, LJ? Because walk denotes walk, a walk implies progress. Uh, That's why Paul is saying you ought to walk and to please God. My question to all of us over Facebook land, are we really walking to please God? Do people see your spiritual progress? 
Can people say without a doubt, I remember when you used to do that. I remember when you used to do that. Or are we doing the same old things? Paul addresses the Christian life like a walk. Paul said this in the book of Ephesians. He said, walk worthy of the vocation that you have been called. Since you've been called into the Christian life, you need to walk like it. Can I get a witness there? I, I know that's tight, but it's right. Uh, see, when you start dealing with sanctification, now we'll lift our hands and we'll shout when we talk about blessing, blessing, blessing. But when you start telling them people how to live, they start looking at you sideways then. Uh, but, but that is the, the story of the Christian life, that we should be different. We should be walking to please God. Paul says, walk worthy of the vocation whereby you've been called. Can I push it? Paul says, walk not as the Gentiles walk. Paul says, if you are a child of God, you shouldn't be walking like those that's in the world. My mom and dad used to remind us every time we leave the house, you are Edwards. And I don't care how the Smiths act, I don't care how the Johnsons act, I don't care how uh, the Joneses act, you are Edwards, you are to be different. And listen, I don't care how the world acts, what the world says, where the world goes. If you carry the name of Christian, your name is attached to Christ, you ought to be, you ought to be different because you're walking to please God. Paul says, walk worthy of the vocation you've been called. Paul says, walk not as the Gentiles. Paul says, walk in love. Paul relates the Christian life to a, a walk. It implies progress. Walk. We're with the vocation. Walk not like the Gentile. Walk in love. That's what we should be identified. I've never seen a time in my life so many nasty Christians. Jesus said, listen, people won't know you because you can quote Bible. People won't know you because you attend church. People won't know you because you give a big tie. Jesus said, listen, people will know that you hooked up with me, that you're rolling with me, that you're running with me. It's because you love one another. I never see the time we got too many nasty, short, patient, mad. Folks, that's proclaiming to be saved. Y'all mighty quiet now. I know Facebook, y'all quiet. Well, what worthy of the vocation? Walk not as the Gentiles. Walk in love. Paul says also, walk as children of the light. Paul said the Christian life should be like a walk. We all should be making progress. We are called to be the light of the world. When Jesus was here first, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then Jesus, uh, knowing that he was about to leave this world, he passed the baton to you and I. He said, now you are the light of the world. And last but not least, yes, walk worthy of your vocation. Yes, walk not as the Gentiles. Yes, walk in love. Yes, walk as you light. But then the Paul tell us, walk by faith <laughs> and not <laughs> by sight. The Christian life, implies that we will be making a spiritual mo movement because we're making progress if we're, we're, if we're really living to please God. Uh, I want to uh, relate this walking like a little baby. I, I begin to say, what illustration? Because there are two major things that all of us need in order to walk to please God. And I thought about a little baby. Number one, you look at a little baby. That little baby was born into the world. <laughs> and we begin to put that little baby on the floor, put him, in his, uh, him or her on their little blanket. And before you know it, they're just trying to scoot on the floor. Uh, 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 say desire. There are two things that we all need in order to walk. You got to have desire. And you know, you know that that little baby over uh, uh, next several months, as it begins to grow and, and, and it begins to strengthen itself, and, and, and all of a sudden, it begins to pull up on things. Can I get a witness? Say desire. Uh, that baby get, gets a desire, and, and, and that baby uh, has the urge that, I, and is looking at other people walking in the house. Lord, have mercy. Can I push it? 
uh, uh, people should see other believers walking to please God. That should give them a desire to walk. That's the problem now. Believers not seeing other believers walking how they ought to walk. That's not. That's why they're not walking that way. Church is full of folks that making excuses not to walk to please God. But that little baby has a desire. Begin to pull up on things and it feels his little leg getting strengthened. And before you know it, Ebony, that, little, that little baby takes a step. I said walk denotes or implies progress. But you got to have desire. And that little baby gets a desire. And before you know it, that little, that little baby done made a step. And, and we get excited. And, and today, y'all know, we get our phones out and we begin to record that thing. Can I get a witness there? We get excited. We send it to mama and papa. We send it to the cousin. We send it all of, because you say, oh, my baby's making progress. And that's how the Christian church should be. We should be excited when we see men and women making spiritual progress because they are walking to please God. But there's another thing that that baby has and that we all need if we are going to walk. That baby has desire. But can I tell you what else, Genesis? That baby has determination. You got to have determination. If you really, if I'm really going to walk to please God, yes, it starts with desire. But you got to have some determination. Because that little baby will falter, wouldn't it? it, it that little baby is unstable. At first. And not only does the baby uh, falter, but sometimes the baby gets frustrated. And, and it falters and frustrated, and sometimes the baby even falls. But it's determined to. Can I just talk to y'all? I don't care how you falter. I don't care how frustrated you get. I don't even care you that you fall. The Bible says a just man falleth down seven times, but he what? Gets back up again. A just man, a just woman said, listen, I am determined to walk to please God. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. I am a new man, a new woman in Jesus Christ, and I am going to walk to please God today. You need desire, and you need determination. I'm going to tell you, the man or woman that I can tell you that's not walking to please God, number one, they don't have no desire. And sure enough, they don't have no determination because if you're really serious about this by the power of the holy spirit we can walk to please god let's break down our text here in first thessalonians chapter four remember now remember now the thessalonians are in an immoral culture and Paul is wanting to remind them just like the immoral culture that you and I are living in in 2020 Paul wants to remind them, I understand how they are living, but let me tell you how you ought to be living. You ought to be living to walk to please God. First point I want to make, Paul's exhortation. Paul is going to urge, that's what the word exhortation means. He's going to urge or he's going to encourage them you got to walk to please God. And that's what I want to do. I want to urge us. We call it motivation. You know, many people, they don't want a good preacher. They want a motivational speaker. <laughs> uh, can I push it again? Uh, uh, you know, today's church, they don't really want a Bible-believing, fire-dragging, preaching preacher. They want an inspirational, motivational speaker. Uh, Paul said, I'm trying to urge you. Number one, Paul's exhortation here, verse 1 and verse 2. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, Finally, then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you, through the Lord Jesus. Number one, our first point is Paul's exhortation. Paul is urging, Paul is encouraging them, you got to walk to please God. In other words, what Paul is doing, Paul is charging them. Get this now, verse 2, Paul says, For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Paul said, I'm urging you, I'm encouraging you, obey what the word of the Lord says. That's all I'm trying to do. 
I'm just trying to get men and women that will get to a point that it's not Lee that's saying that. Lee is proving it by the book. Paul says, I'm urging you, I'm encouraging you. No more Paul give his exhortation. Paul said, I'm charging you. You got to obey God's commandment. The thing about life, Facebook Live, all of us here, we're all trying to walk to please somebody. Come on, y'all, let's talk, let's talk. There is some man in Facebook land going head over heels trying to please his wife. There's some woman, some wife, all in Facebook land, all they trying to go head over the heels to try to please their husband. There are parents that are doing somersaults trying to please their children. Can I push it? There are some members all over Facebook land trying to please p -p 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 pastor. That's what sheep say, right? P -p 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 pastor. But this is the testimony, though. I understand trying to please all of them, but we better make sure we're trying to please him. Uh, pleasing God must be the priority of our lives. I hear Matthew 6.33 say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Come here, question. I know you're trying to please your boss. I know you're trying to please your p -p -p pastor. I know you're trying to please your wife. I know you're trying to please your husband. I know you're trying to please your children. I know you're trying to please your parents. I know you're trying to please your neighbor. Come in, let's talk. But are you trying to please God? Paul said, I'm urging you. I'm exhorting you. These are the commandments that come from the Lord himself. And I'm just trying to get you to obey. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. This is what Paul wrote in the book of Galatians. And Paul, first point, he says, this is my exhortation. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, For do I now persuade men, or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I will not be a bondservant of Christ. Let me just tell you what the problem is. Let me tell you what the problem is with Christians, why we can't walk to please God, because we're in people's bondage. I just pushed it right there. People are more concerned and people are more consumed with pleasing everybody else than Jesus. That's why they can't walk to please God. Paul said, listen, you got to make a decision. Either you're going to please God or you're going to please man, but you're not going to do both. Paul also, well, Jesus said this in John's gospel. John's gospel, chapter 8, verse 29. This is what... Uh, uh, Jesus said, for I always do those things that please him. Listen to what Jesus says. I always do those things that please him. Jesus said, listen, my number one mission in life is to make sure I please the Father. I, I want to ask us a question this morning. Is that, is that our number one mission? But guess what? I don't mind making Brother Mike mad as long as I'm doing God's will. I, I don't mind making Bean mad, uh, but see, that's the problem. We're afraid to make people's mad and displease God than to make God happy and displease man. Paul said, this is my exhortation. You are to walk to please God. This is my charge to you. And, and Paul said, you ought to do it more and more. <laughs> Every day, we should be walking to please God. What? More and more. Uh, let me go back. You know, you know. see, with all this technology right now, y'all know from time to time, I have to remind y'all, I'm a 70s kid. And, and when I talk about how we live to please people, you know, back in the day, you know, when you, you met that girl or you, you met that boy, uh, uh, and when, you know, it was that long cord in the house, and there was only one phone in the house, and, and especially if you had siblings, you had to fight to get the phone. You had to get on the phone uh, before they got on the phone. Uh, you weren't going to get on the phone. But, but you wanted to please him. You wanted to please her. And you would stay on that phone for hours. And just as you know your brother or sister want to use the phone, you don't been on there two hours. Or maybe it's late at night. I'm talking about who are you living to please? Because you wanted to please them. And, and both of you about to fall asleep. And you know you better get off that phone for mama pick up. Well, if we had two phones, mama pick up that other phone, you won't get embarrassed. Uh, but this is what we say, you hang up. And, and they say, no, you hang up. And you say, no, you hang up. And they say, no, you hang up. Say, on the count of three, we, uh, we both are hang up. And they say, one, two, three, I thought you was going to hang up. <laughs> I thought you, but, but that's how we wanted to please them. 
Come here. Can't we, can't we get to the point that we love Jesus like that? That we're willing to be up all night, do whatever it takes to please our master? Because that's what he did for us, right? He went to the car. Remember Jesus in Gethsemane? Jesus on Golgotha, Jesus out of the grave. He did whatever he needed to do to please the Father, and it was for our benefit. Paul said, you ought to do it more and more. Verse 1, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4 and 15, your progress should be evident to all. In other words, if you're really walking to please God, other people should notice it. You don't have to walk around with a sign, I'm trying to please God. No, the fruit of your walk will show people who you're trying to please. Can I get a witness there? This is a charge. It's like an elder or an ordination charge to a deacon. Uh, when, when you give a charge to an elder, when you give a charge to an ordained deacon, what you are doing, you're reminding them of their great responsibility. And that's what Paul is doing. Paul is saying, listen, church, I'm reminding you, your great responsibility in life is the walk to please God. It is the same mindset Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when Paul tells his young understudy, his young protege Timothy, he says, I charge you before God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who's ready to judge the living and the dead at his appearing, preach the word. That's the same charge there. Timothy, let me tell you something. When you stand up there with the word of God, don't play games. I'm charging you, preach the word. It's the same mindset. Every day we're charged with walking to please God. Say Paul's exhortation. But now we see the believer's sanctification. Paul is now going to shift to that word that we're dealing with in our series off limits. Listen to what Paul says in verse 3. For this is the will of God. Your what? Y'all got your Bibles open still? Uh, Facebook, keep those Bibles open. Number one, Paul's exhortation, but now he deals with the believer's sanctification. Verse 3, for this is the will of God, your, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual, immor- I'm going to Maryland in just a minute, that each, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification. Paul said, this is my exhortation, but now it's the believer's responsibility to have sanctification. Guess why? Because this is the will of God. I'm, I'm not making this stuff up right here in verse 3. For this is the will of God. Your what? Listen, sanctification is not about the, the name of a church. They go to Mount Holiness, Little Baptist, Fire Mountain, sanctified. No, 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 no. Sanctification is a way of life for all believers. We are to be what? Set apart. We are to be separate. We are to be pure. We are to be holy as children of God. Paul says... I mean, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. I know, I know people in Facebook land, you ready to close the Bible, keep them Bibles open. We're dealing with holiness now. Remember now, too many preachers are so busy telling people what they can get for God, from God. They're not telling people they got to live godly before God. I'm trying to teach us how we need to live, because if you live right, God will bless you right. Can I get a witness there? If you just live right, God will bless you right. The problem is many people don't know how to, talk how to live. We got to walk to please God. So Paul says, listen, believers, it's about sanctification. You got to be off limits to the world. Listen, brothers and sisters, though we will never be sinless, because we got a sin nature in us, though we will never be sinless every day, as we're walking to please God, we should be sinning less. I'm gonna, I know I gotta come on this side and say that. Listen, y'all. Even though we will never be sinless in this life, meaning because of that sin nature that live in us, if we're really making progress, we're walking to please God. Every day we should be sinning less. If God is our focus, Paul says, "Yes, I'm giving you a 
exhortation, but now I'm talking about your sanctification. In Genesis 5, chapter 5, verse 24, the Bible talks about, oh, Enoch. Enoch walked with God. My question is, listen at, listen at this now. The Bible said Enoch walked with God. Genesis 5, 24. Who are you walking with? Who are you walking with, Facebook land? Because nine times out of ten, whoever we're walking with proves who we're trying to please. The Bible said Enoch walked with God. Now, Hebrews 11 gives more commentary about Enoch. The Bible says Enoch walked so close to God that God took him. Lord, have mercy. I said Enoch walked so close to God that God took him. My question is, who are you walking with? Enoch walked so close to God, the Hebrew writer said that God took him because he had this testimony. He pleased God. What is the testimony going on about you and you? Facebook land, what is the testimony going on about? Enoch had the testimony that he walked to please God. What is the testimony of our lives as Christians? If we're going to be successful with our sanctification, then we must submit to God's will. Let me say that again. If we are going to be successful in our sanctification, it's going to take us submitting ourselves to God's will. What does God want for me in my life? It's not about what I want. It's about what he wants. Isn't that how Jesus lived? Jesus lived that life. He said, I came here to do one thing. I came here to be about my father's business. Yes, Paul's exhortation. But now we see in verse 3, verse 4, we see the believers, what? Sanctification. But now let me push it. Say off limits. Say off limits. Say walking to please God. Number one, Paul's exhortation, but now the believer's sanctification. Now watch this. No fornication. Don't close those Bibles. Stay with me for just a little while longer. Paul now is going to bring, you know, the will of God is a lot. It's the will of God that men be saved and that none perish. It is the will of God that we walk in love. It's a lot of things. But now, Paul is going to bring the will of God specifically into not fornicating. <laughs> y'all, but it's quiet. Now, uh, uh, y'all stay with me now. I say, walk in to please God. Paul's exhortation, I urge you, I encourage you that you should walk to please God. Then he talks about the believer's sanctification. This is the will of God, that you live separated, that you live separate, that you live in holiness, you live in purity. And Paul says, now, let me get specific, that there be no fornication. That the believers in Thessalonica need to live abstaining themselves from fornication. I'm right here in the book. I'm about to go meddling right now. Verse 4, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in what? Sanctification and honor. Uh, the mindset here, my body is not here to, for me to use it for what I want to do. My body is to be used to glorify God. Not Verse 5, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not no God. Verse 3 again, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual what? Immorality. Uh, we got to get that because Paul's exhortation of the believer's sanctification, but now Paul said no fornication. Paul says avoid all types of sexual immorality. Okay, okay. 
Uh, the problem is, the problem is with the believers today, 2020 believers, uh, uh, we don't have no self-control. And if we're going to live sanctified lives, if we're going to abstain from fornication, I'm about to break down what fornication is because some people don't have a clue. Uh, we got to have some self-control. We just say whatever we want to say out of our mouth. We just put whatever we want to put in our mouth. We just do whatever we want to do. We don't have, do y'all know that self-control is a fruit of the spirit? Oh, y'all, y'all not following. I'm going to slow down right now. I'm almost through. In Galatians chapter 5, when Paul said, the fruit of the spirit is these, love, joy, peace, temperance. And then he says, self-control. But I'm amazed these days of the lack of self-control believers have. Oh, I just had to give them a piece of my mind. You ain't got much of it anyway, but, but you're talking about you had to give somebody a piece of your mind. And you can't control, you, you can't keep your mouth quiet because you always got to have the last word. I'm pushing it right now. A Paul said, listen, if you're going to abstain from fornication, you got to live with some type of self-control. Oh, today, food got us in trouble way in the Garden of Eden. And food still getting us in big trouble today. I just pushed it right there. No self-control, but now it comes to the, the, the sexual part. Uh, we live loose because we lust too much. Mm. We live loose because we lust too much. Men and women. Every skirt a man see now, that all they doing look at it. Say, I ain't afraid. Women, all their blouses, all open up. I'm going to take them. Yeah, you can't take a selfie without their blouse. I, I know I just pushed it. Yeah, I know, I know. Y'all know I ain't scared. A brother trying to live right, and these girls steady doing wrong. A woman trying to live right, hey, he doing wrong. Uh, Paul said, listen, this is my exhortation that you have sanctification, but he said there will be no fornication. Man, let, me, let, me, let me get back in the text. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. He said, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual... I, I'm, I'm hitting that self-control. I'm trying to conclude this thing, but it's getting good to me because the problem is there's a lack of self-control in the church. Modesty is just gone now. Remember now, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, you are to take your spirit and your body and glorify God. Well, you know, I work out. I need to show it off. No, you don't. Show it off to your husband and show it off to your wife. Oh, I'm just pushing it right now. Can I get a witness? See, we live too loose. That's why we lust. Uh, I, I, I like that. We live too loose. We just do everything now, anything now. And that's why we wonder why we Paul said, but let there be no fornication. Let me tell you what fornication. Let me go and get through with this. Fornication is any act of sexual immorality. That is married people, husband and wife, the husband stepping outside of the marriage covenant. Yes, it's called adultery, but sexual immorality in its totality is fornication. Guess what? If you step outside of your marriage on your wife, you just committed sexual immorality. That's fornication. It is a wife cheating on her husband. Can I push it? It's two heterosexuals. Because we like to beat down the homosexuals. I ain't scared. No, I'm going to preach the whole counsel of the word of God. It's two, it's two heterosexuals, a man and a woman, having sex, and they are not married. That's fauna. Oh, Y'all know I'm not scared. You know, we, we, we try to dress sin up. We put a little bonnet. We put a cute little skirt on sin. You know, common law marriage. What's that? Ain't no such thing in no common law marriage. Either you're married, either you're pregnant. Can I get a witness? Either you're saved. Ain't, ain't no such thing, no common law, man. I'm going to push this thing right now. You know, Jesus addressed that issue about shacking up. See, we done made that, even Christians done made that thing the norm now. You know, just moving in together. I'm going to push it right now. Jesus met a woman at the well. Let me, let me get in. I'm going to Maryland right now. Jesus met a woman at the well, and I'm going to go and skip all the rigmarole. And Jesus said, go get your husband. And she said... I, 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 I ain't got none. And he said, you're right, you've had five, 
and the man you shack it, see that's what the old folk used to call it. Shacking up with. The man that you're living with, he's not your husband. I perceive that you are a prophet, no duh. <laughs> For real? See, Jesus addressed that we need to get married in order to prevent fornication. Paul wrote, he said, we are to flee fauna. I'm a 70s kid, so my older folks going to read. What does the word flee? It's like born Luke Duke from Roscoe or Enos. <laughs> if, you, if you're not a 70s kid, you ain't going to remember that. Every Friday night, we had the Dukes of Hazard. We had a little house on the prairie. We had Dallas and uh, Hee Haw. <laughs> but we were waiting to see them Duke boys flee from Roscoe and Enos. They were, they were trying to get away. That's what Paul is saying. Hey, believers, get away from sexual immorality. But the problem is we lack self-control. That's what got David in trouble. David didn't have self-control, right? He inquired about Bathsheba. Who is that chick down there in apartment B? That's Uriah the Hittite's wife. David, don't mess with her, but David lacked self just like many of us. There's a story about a man who was going to work. He had got overweight. Say self-control. He got overweight and uh, he made a decision. I'm going to have some self-control. But what was the problem? This was the issue. See, what had happened was there was a donut shop on the way to work. And every morning he walked walk in there with a dozen of donuts and he would just about eat that dozen. So he was struggling with self-control. So he made a decision. You know what? I'm going to do better. I'm not going to drive by that donut shop. And he did good for three mornings. He took a detour route. But this particular morning, after three mornings walking in the world successful without bringing in a dozen of donuts, on this particular morning, they were doing some work on the roads. And the work that they were doing on the road led him back by the donut, say self-control. And, and as he got close to the donut shop, he just rolled down the window and said, I'm going to smell it, but I ain't going in. <laughs> Y'all know that good smell of them Krispy Kreme. Y'all know y'all can't handle that red sign when y'all stop riding now and skid away. <laughs> can I get away now, Duran, Baker's Pride. <laughs> but, but, but he rolled down the window and, and, and he swiffed it. He said, you know what, though? He said, uh, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. He said, the only way I stop, it got to be God's will. There got to be a parking space right in front of the donut shop. So... He got to work, he had a dozen of donuts, and the ex said, well, well, you, got, you got a parking space, right? He said, yeah, after eight times around the block. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, that's how we do. We force of what we try to pretend is the will of God. He drove eight times around that donut shop until finally he gave in to his flesh. That's the moral of the story. No, we got to live with self-control. Paul said, listen, this is my exhortation. Uh, 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 that believers live in sanctification, but there'll be no fornication. The Puritans live as though there were no such thing as sex. We live as though there's nothing else but sex. I'm not talking about the marriage. I'm talking about out here in this lustful world that we live in. Paul says here in verse 3 through 5, for this is the will of God, your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual what? Immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessels. That is married people cheating. That is two heterosexuals. Having sex is not married. That's homosexuality. That's lesbian. Whatever goes outside of the will of God is sexual immorality. Quick review. Number one, Paul's exhortation. Say walk to please God. Number two, the believers, sanctification. Be separate. Be holy. Be pure. Number three, no fornication. Control. Listen to what he says in verse five. Not in passion of lust. We live so loose. That's why we lust. 
Verse 4 again, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. And I tell you once again, that's why I don't go everywhere. That's why I don't watch everything because I'm trying to control, I'm trying to prevent sexual immorality from coming to my life. And the only way I do that, I got to walk to please God. It got to be bigger than terrain. See, it got to be bigger than Lee. See, if we're going to keep ourselves sexually pure, there must be a big God that we'll focus on. Can I get a witness? Verse 5. Not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who know not God. Paul said we shouldn't be living like the Gentiles who don't even know God. He says this, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such. I'm ending with this now. As we also forewarn you and testify, for God did not call us to uncleanness. God did not call us to sexual immorality, but what? Holy. We don't talk about that word in the church no more. God, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's still holy. And guess what we are to be, church? We are to be holy. Verse 8. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but who? Let me, let me tell you what I learned as a pastor years ago. God didn't call me to make you obey him. He just called me to tell you how to obey him. Because guess what? When you reject this word that I'm preaching line upon line, precept upon precept, you ain't rejecting Lee. You rejecting God. See, preachers got to get there. You ain't called to make nobody do nothing. You just call them to tell them what God said. And God said, I'm calling them. Telling Lee to tell you, you better walk to please me. So number one, Paul's exhortation. Number two, the believer's sanctification. Number three, no fornication, but now God's in the nation. If we live in a sexual, immoral way, guess what we are going to face? God's wrath. God's in the nation. It's right here in the text as we conclude. Right here in the text. Verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the what? Avenger of all such. As we also what? Forewarn you. You and what? Testify. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his. So the last point, God's in the nation. God takes sexual immorality serious. And I'm going to tell the church, we got a lot of believers that take their sexual immorality too lightly. No, when we live in an immoral way, we're going to face God's in the nation. Can I push it? God takes this so serious. Because not to walk to please God. Listen, when we commit sexual immorality, let me, let me just go ahead and say this. Uh, just stay with me for five more minutes and we're through. People talk about safe sex. See, the world has limited safe sex to a condom and birth control pills. No, 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 no. Safe sex is doing it, no pun intended, doing it the way God says do it. That's what safe sex is. One man with one woman under the covenant of marriage. That's God's definition of safe sex. Why does God take this thing serious? Number one, sexual immorality. With sexual immorality, homes are destroyed. Let, let me say this. Say homes are destroyed. You take a wife, cheats on her husband, and leaves her husband for another man, that home has been what? Destroyed. You take a man that cheats on his wife and then leaves his wife for that little mistress. You know I always say Susie the Floozy, Rico Suave, they destroy homes. I'm pushing it now, see y'all quiet on me. Not only is homes destroyed with sexual immorality, watch this, can I push it? Not only homes are destroyed, but health is damaged. Do y'all know there's still such thing called STDs? Y'all mighty slow this morning. 
Not only homes are destroyed, but health is damaged with STDs, AIDS, gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia. Oh, I'm pushing it now, so y'all quiet now. Not only homes are damaged, not only health, I mean homes are destroyed, health is damaged, but holiness is not demonstrated. We don't show the world how we should be keeping ourselves pure because we are compromising on sexual purity. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. God says this about fornication. Marriage is honorable and among all and the bed undefiled. God said, listen, I created sex in the form, in the, in the union of marriage. God said, listen, have at it as long as you are married. One man with what? One woman. God is not against sex. He created it. He said, it's for procreation in your pleasure. Can I get a witness? Can I push it? I thank God that he did. Amen. I mean, if God talked about it, shouldn't we? See, that's the problem. The church don't talk about it in the way that God has ordained it. So that's why people get out there and abuse their bodies all kind of ways. No, God has no problem with sex. He said, just let it be under the covenant institution of marriage, one man, one woman. But in the Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, God says this about fornication. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. God said, I, Jesus, I have no problem with the marriage bed. Enjoy yourself. But this is what he says. But the, for, but the fornicator and the adulterer, God will judge. God says, I endorse my delight when you're married, watch this now, we ending, God's indignation, God said, I endorse my delight when you're married, but I enforce my discipline when you're not. Mm, mm, mm. God says, I endorse my delight, I put my stamp of approval. When you're married, husband and wife, enjoy yourself. But when you're not married, and you're going outside of the word of God, I will enforce my discipline to the child of God. Can I get a witness there? I conclude with saying this. There was a member came to the pastor. I say off limits, walking to please God. A member was upset with a pastor for preaching against sin in the lives of Christians. And many people do get offended. They'll be all right. She said this, sin in the lives of a believer is different from sin in the lives of the unsaved people. The pastor said, yep, it's worse. Sin in the life of a believer is worse than sin in the life of the unbeliever. Because we should be different. Remember what I said in, I think, one of our first messages. The most miserable person in the world is a saint that ain't living right. That's the most miserable person in the world. Because if you have God's Holy Spirit on the inside of you, and you are living ungodly, he is going to bring some hard conviction. Can I get a witness there? We've concluded our series entitled Off Limits. M.C. Hammer, that great poet, said, you can't touch this. Purity must be our priority. God delivered us to be different. Out with the old, in with the new. And today, our final message in our series, Walking to Please God. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for this series, Lord, on sanctification that, Lord, we've been commanded to live different as the body of Christ. And, Father, preachers must get back to preaching your word for what it is. It's truth that men and women will know how they should conduct themselves in a sinful world. To realize that our Facebook page represents us. Our emails represents us. Our Instagram represents us. But most importantly, it represents you. Whatever we post, if we say that we name the name of Jesus and we proclaim to be children of the Most High 
people are watching it. And we must be careful. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, Facebook Live, we thank you for joining us. In just a minute, we are going to partake in virtual communion. We ask that you get yourself together and prepare with your elements, your saltine cracker, your bread with some type of juice. But while we are headed towards that, I want to remind you, maybe once again, you have stumbled upon Beulah and you like what you're seeing and you like what you're hearing and you want to know more about Beulah. We want to hear from you. We really do. You can go to info at BeulahBBC.com. Send us an email, a word of encouragement to tell us to continue to do what we're doing. We're grateful to be able to bring service to you even in the midst of this pandemic. Also, members of Beulah, I first of all, as your pastor, want to thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity that has been coming over the last several Sundays while we've been apart physically. You have been dynamic, and I just want to uh, encourage those who may not have yet done their part as a member of Beulah. Remember, you can give three ways. You could go online to www.beulahbbc.com, click on that donation button, and you could give to us that way. Or you can mail it in to Beulah Baptist Church, 619 East Anderson Street, Savannah, Georgia, 31401. Or you could drop by and put it in our front door in a secure location, and we'll receive it that way. Once again, I thank God for his service to you today through Facebook Live. But now we're going to come with a very sacred part of our service on the third Sunday of each month here at Beulah Baptist Church, we strive to obey the word of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, before he was betrayed by Judas, he sat in the upper room with his disciples, knowing that Golgotha was before him, that he was about to pay the price, the ultimate price for our sins. He sat in the upper room that was prepared, and as he sat in that upper room with his disciples, he took bread and broke and gave it to his disciples. And then he took a cup, poured, and gave it to them and says, Take drink of the fruit of the vine, for I drink it no more, till I drink it afresh in my Father's kingdom. Paul wrote a very stern letter in, to the Corinthians. In Corinthians chapter 11, he said, The reason many of you are sick the reason, the reason many of you are weak and some have even been judged is because you partake of this, the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion, but you're not examining yourself. You're not looking within. I'm going to offer a prayer and I ask that before we take these elements that we apply 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 to our heart. John wrote, he said, if you confess your sin, God is faithful and just enough to forgive you of that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we come and we say thank you that as we come to commemorate, we come to reflect, we come to remember what your Holy Son did for us 2,000 years ago. But Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to partake in the Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. Father, I ask that you turn this count on use into a spiritual use. Lord, these elements that we are using to represent the body of our Lord and the blood of our Lord, Lord, consecrate them, Lord. But most important, Lord, I pray that whatever sin is in our lives, that we are confessing before a holy God who is fully aware of everything that we do. The word confess means to acknowledge. Lord, we have to take ownership to our sin. Lord, I did such and such. And when we do that, God, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to take the bread and the Bible says they all ate together. Let's eat together. 
and they all drink together, let us drink together. They went out into a mine of olives. You need priests, you can take your position for the last selection. They went out into a mine of olives. We don't have a physical mine of olives, but we do have a world where, believe, where people are dying in sin, and it's our responsibility to tell a dark and dying world about a resurrected Savior. Once again, we are honored that we've been able to minister to you by the means of Facebook Live. We're now going to hear our final selection in our service today from Unique Praise. God bless.
understand the great price that Jesus paid, we would desire to walk to please the Father. I want to make this last statement. Though salvation is free, our sanctification will cost us everything. I'm going to say that again. Though salvation was free, it's a free gift from God our Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctification will cost us everything. Once again, we thank the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank our musicians. We want to thank Unique Praise, our leadership, all of our tech people for being here once again, sacrificing that we can bring you a service that can glorify our God and edify you. Let us pray. Father, thank you once again. Lord, you're worthy. You're so worthy. Thank you once again for allowing us the privilege to, to worship you and to honor you and to serve you. Lord, cover us with your, your precious blood. Lord, continue to grace us for the life that you've called us to live. That every day we can abound more and more as we strive to walk to please you. Father, thank you. These are all blessed we ask in Jesus' name. And every heart said... Thank you.